Hey guys, Montel here, and welcome to this edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. My guest today is a visionary leader in the cannabis industry with a background in engineering, of all things, but energy management and automation and a passion for horticulture. In 2016, he was appointed by the governor of Oregon, Kate Brown, to the task force for cannabis environmental best practices and continues to work with this today through the Resource Innovation Institute, an organization building the central platform for creating energy efficiency solutions and standards for the global cannabis industry. He's also on the board of directors for the Oregon Cannabis Association, and he's an advisory board member at the Marijuana Business Daily and Ben's Best, the new venture uh, created by Ben Cohen of Ben & Jerry's fame aimed at funding Black-owned cannabis companies and further supporting the Colorado Criminal Justice Reform Coalition and the Last Prisoner Project. He served on numerous federal, state, and local cannabis regulatory advisory committees to help shape the legal cannabis markets in both Oregon and California. He is a CEO at Loud, an award-winning cannabis company in Oregon. Jesse Horton, thank you so much for being a part of Let's Be Blunt with Montel today, sir. Wow. Thank you so much, Montel. It's a real pleasure and honor to be here. Oh, my goodness, sir. When you say wow, I hope you're saying wow to your introduction because, dude, you have, are quite a uh, entrepreneur. I mean, you really literally have set a standard, I think, in this business for a lot of people to see if they can try to emulate and copy. So thank you again for being here. Let's get started, though, and talk a little bit about your background before you got involved in cannabis. And um, where'd you grow up and, and what were you taught about cannabis in your early years? Man, um, so it's been a long time. I uh, I was I was raised uh, in the southeastern U.S. I was born in Virginia, lived in a few places there, and traveled uh, probably every two or three years after that, all still within the southeast. And that's because my dad constantly was taking a new position, a new position at his job as far as he can go. And and throughout that period, they tried their hardest to keep me away from cannabis. Um, you know, my dad would drug test me in high school, surprise drug tests, um, would get punished all the time. My mom was, you know, really hard on me. What I realized later was because my dad actually spent seven years in prison uh, for a cannabis distribution charge um, before he was supposed to go to college. So, you know, it was tough um, in, in the Southeast from my parents' perspective, but I was also arrested a few times for cannabis um, you know, much to their uh, to their dismay. Um, so arrested for just minor possession charges. That's right. Yeah. All under two grams, uh, three grams. One time I was arrested for a seed uh, and spent the night in jail uh, for having a cannabis seed and charged with I think paraphernalia or something like that. So, um, well, now that seed didn't have any THC in it at the time. So you shouldn't have been charged at all because you could have been charged with hemp. I mean, legally, a lot of people don't know the law. But I mean, by truth, you can walk around with a bag full of cannabis seeds, but cannabis seeds have no THC in them. Uh, it hasn't developed, hasn't grown into it yet. So therefore, what are they charging you for? A lot of times not that having that knowledge of the law is what can keep you in trouble. Though, and nowadays, since the hemp uh, bill has passed or the Farm Act has passed, you know, all seeds until they grow beyond six weeks, you can't discern any THC, so therefore you got to be arrested for just having hemp. And then if you're arrested for hemp, then it's not against the law. You're a thousand percent right, man. When it comes down to those laws and those little things of what they charge you with, knowing what to say in those moments, um, knowing to have good attorneys can be a big difference. I mean, my dad had just, um, I think he had maybe a, a number of different um, packages of cannabis. And because uh, they charged him with distribution, versus possession, uh, the next years of his life uh, happened a little bit differently. So you're a thousand percent right, Montel. It's so important. And you know, it's even crazy. I mean, there are some states out here right now. Let's talk about this a little bit that you brought it up. But there are states out here right now that still have draconian laws in place. Um, and you really have to do your research. If you're going to travel holding, you better travel holding with an education um, and, and educate yourself on the local laws. Um, you, you're right. Your dad probably got charged if he had maybe two or three different little packets of cannabis on him. 
they put the three of those little packets together and said, oh, you have more than one packet, so therefore you must be a distributor. But if the total volume weight was under X number for whatever that state was, he couldn't have been charged with or should not have been charged with trafficking. So it's kind of a, you know, I, I guess it's a, not buyer beware, but, you know, if you're going to be holding, you best know what you're holding in the state that you're standing in, right? Yeah, yeah. There was just a um, situation where a U.S. veteran, a military veteran, excuse me, I don't remember his name, um, but had a medical card purchased in a medical state. But because I think he was pulled over in either Alabama or Mississippi, one of those states, um, ended up spending, you know, a lot of time in jail um, because he admitted that he had cannabis and he was just traveling through the state. So it's really crazy uh, how, you know, those experiences with cannabis can be really different. Absolutely. And that, 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 that's driving me nuts right now, but we'll get to some more of that conversation a little bit later. Tell me a little bit about, you know, um, you know, you have a degree in engineering from what school and where'd you get your degree and where'd you go to school? And then what was that? You, you probably got a degree in engineering because you had a different, you know, um, idea of what your career path was going to be, huh? Man, uh, you know, I, I would like to think I was thinking that, you know, that, that, that ahead when I decided engineering. To be honest, uh, it was just because I was really good at math, you know, and I'm thinking what, you know, what's the best major where I can get girls and, you know, get a chance to get a good job. Mm. And uh, engineering was, you know, the one that, the one that aligned in both of those paths. So that was the one I chose. I was lucky, uh, you know, to choose that path. It ended up being the right one for me. And I'm using a lot of those skills now, even though I'm not, you know, directly in the engineering field anymore. What school did you go to? Florida State, Florida State University. Yep. Congratulations, my friend. I got a, I, uh, you and I have that in common. My degree is in general engineering from the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis. Okay. So, you know, and I, I, I chose engineering because I was, at, at the time, you know, again, I was getting ready to graduate and become, I, I thought, a pilot in the Marine Corps. And so I thought, let me just find the path of least resistance. I didn't want to go into like one of the super, super advanced engineering majors at the Naval Academy. So I took general engineering, but I also minored in international security affairs, which was uh, something that I've used and kept this mouth busy with quite a bit in life. Um, but as you say, you know, I think it's it's having a knowledge of how to problem solve is what engineering gives you the biggest basis for and being able to systematically step by step by step by step by step, you know, come up with a question, come up with a solution and a, a you know, pathway to that solution, I think is probably what engineering is, has, uh, has given you the best though, huh? Man, you, you know it exactly. And I, I did uh, industrial engineering, which, you know, all the electrical and, uh, you know, the, the chemical and civil guys will say that's, that's pretty much general engineering, you know, where it's just yeah. the, the lead the path of least resistance in the engineering, but you get a good background in all those areas. And that that's exactly it, man. It teaches you how to how to problem solve, how to whether it's math, whether it's actual industry problems, uh, whatever it may be. How do you understand the problem? How do you develop a system to find the solution and make sure that is, you know, that it's actually um, feasible? And then when I went on to work with the German engineering company at Siemens. They really hone that even more with that kind of like German systematic way of thinking and methodologies that really shaped kind of my, you know, my thought pattern uh, after school. So after school, you're, you're employed by a very, I mean, really a prestigious company and you're on your path to, you know, engineering success. But what made you think about cannabis? What brought you back to cannabis? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, um, you know, to be, I, I try not to get too too deep or philosophical, but honestly, it's, I think it was one, one question or one really prayer that I, that I told myself, and I'm not a religious guy, but, you know, I happened to interview for an amazing position in Munich, Germany, uh, at the headquarters in Siemens, um, you know, one of two positions that was available that year to people under 30 years old, you had to be recommended and go through all these different processes to get over there. And I, you know, I was awarded that position and I was just over there thinking, man, I really, you know, every day I'm there and I'm, you know, I'm doing well in my job and I'm learning German and I'm really excelling, but I couldn't wait, you know, to the weekend so I can go, you know, sneak off to Amsterdam, right? And go hop on the train and spend some time there, you know, looking at the canals and experiencing that real 
freedom with cannabis that I didn't understand because I was still on the East Coast before coming to Germany. I didn't really spend any time on the West Coast at all. So, you know, during that time, I'm like, man, like I'm, I'm at the height of my career, but I really am not enjoying this. I'm thinking I'm trying to do other things. Like what if I could actually pour everything that I had into like a real passion into that same day to day job? What if I could really align my love with you know, my skills and my abilities, you know, and I just, I thought about that. And I, you know, I told, I, I prayed almost every night. I'm like, God, you know, God help me to find something where I could, um, you know, I could really give everything that I had um, and really pour everything that you've given me into this, but also I can help other people at the same time, because I felt like if, if I can get those things together, that was really the, the ideal. That's the epitome. So I said that all the time. At the same time, or kind of what led to that prayer was me reading The Alchemist. Um, you know, I read The Alchemist and I'm, you know, thinking about the universe shifting in the direction that helps you to align with your purpose and all these different things. And I'm like, man, let me, let me hopefully find that. And then after my delegation, about a year and a half in Munich, um, they offered me a couple of different positions. One was in New York, which was, you know, super corporate. Uh, I was like an audit staff type of position. And then the other one was in Portland, um, which if you've ever been to Portland, you know, there's not a lot corporate about, you know, Portland. And also it was a sales position. So I could, you know, I was selling automation and robotics and those types of things, but I can make my own schedule. I can make as much money. So it was that freedom and that idea of, you know, at least giving the, giving me the chance to align what I loved and that freedom to to find what I really wanted to do. So I took that position. Within a month, Montel, I was um, in the dispensary, you know, picking up a clone, you know, a little plant and, and seeds and, you know, picking up, you know, the different strains. And I was just in a wonderland. And I ended up spending all my time doing that, you know, growing in my basement, talking to, to different grow shop owners, um, talking to different people in the industry, uh, reading on different blogs about how to diagnose cow mag issues in cannabis plants and all these different things that people were talking about and also spending time down at the legislature in Salem uh, learning about the new medical laws that were happening at the time, 2016, where they were finally, you know, making things a little bit more legitimate. Um, this is actually 2012 at that time. 2016 was recreational. 2012 was uh, medicinal. So I just spent all that time and I'm like, man, if I'm spending all this time doing that, first of all, I became horrible at my job. You know, I wasn't spending a lot of time, you know, making appointments with customers. I was in my basement, you know, trying to do that work. So I was like, man, I'm really horrible at this. I need to figure out something else. And just naturally, I kind of was like, man, I'm, I'm good at this. I really enjoy it. Um, and I just, you know, decided uh, to, to jump into cannabis. And the key thing was, first, I was able to get in, right? There were no high barriers of entry at that time where I had to have a million dollars to apply. Um, second, it was more, it was still not quite as regulated to where I could take what I had grown in my basement, Montel, to the dispensary. And if it was good enough, they would buy it and it could be on the shelves. So there weren't all these regulatory hurdles there, right? That made it a lot easier for me to jump in on my own. And, uh, when I did that, you know, I just didn't look back. I just kept going. Well, you know, you just, you just with some of you, what you were talking about, you know, sent me on a little trip down memory lane. Let, let's reminisce a minute. You know, how much did you enjoy the days? What, what years were you going into that Amsterdam? Oh, man. My first trip to Amsterdam was 2007 during the High Times Cannabis Cup. I was probably there at the same time you were there, my friend. I probably saw you bumped into you in the crowd, but just I didn't notice. But, you know, I, I, just, I might have seen you with a big crowd around you, to be honest, man. There was in a Amsterdam? Of, a number of celebrities there. Yeah, you know, I, I used to, I spent quite a bit of time in Amsterdam. Oh, man, I'm telling you, I should say 2005, 6, 7. I was probably there again in 8. Um, yeah, I was there. I was I was there. I was always over there. Had, had a, a lot of fun. Especially a lot of people don't understand that experience, but Amsterdam at the time was one of the only places in the country where it was legal to consume cannabis in things that they called coffee shops. Those coffee shops could sell coffee, not alcohol, and they could also sell cannabis. You could consume cannabis on the spot in that coffee shop. Some of them had some outdoor space you could consume outdoor. And 
you know, blanket. I mean, nobody really complained about anybody walking around, you know, within a block and a half of any one of the, the, the coffee shops lighting up on the street. So it was, uh, it was kind of freedom that you didn't have anywhere here in the United States, right? It helped you to really understand, especially me, you know, coming from someone who'd been arrested. And, you know, I didn't mention, but I, I actually was with General Electric when I was in school. Um, and that from an engineer, you know, engineering position, right? That was like the epitome, especially at that time of an engineering position that could take you somewhere was GE. And I actually got hair tested. Um, and then after I got hair tested and they found cannabis, uh, they looked at my record and saw that I've been arrested. So um, I lost that position and that caused so much stress. And luckily I got with Siemens and I've been arrested three other times. One time I had to drop out of school. So cannabis had always caused so much anguish in my life, even though I, I, I thought it was a benefit to me. You know, the idea of having it out was just so you know, you were so scared, you know, of losing your freedom, of losing everything you had, your opportunities. And um, when I got to Amsterdam and saw that freedom where people, like you said, were were just smoking in coffee shops and no one had problem. And I went to one one uh, restaurant, Montel, where, you know, me and my buddies who were in college, it was our first time going out there. And one of my buddies is like, hey, can we smoke in here? I think it was just a waffle shop, a regular restaurant, not even a cannabis shop. And they're like, uh, yes, uh, but no tobacco. And I'm like, you know, that's it's so different to hear. Yes, you can smoke, but no tobacco. So yes, weed. And that, was, that, that was crazy. I, I will tell you, I remember almost the identical experience. I was eating in a um, a Thai restaurant, and I had been in the coffee shop for. I I visited there with you know several friends, and I had been in a Thai. Uh, no, sorry, I had been in a coffee shop earlier in the day. And we were, you know, getting a little hungry. So it was time to go grab something to eat, lunchtime, a little bit later than lunch, late brunch. And um, I went to this Thai, Thai restaurant and I was sitting there and I'm thinking, and I still had, you know, plenty of product from the coffee shop in both pockets and everything. And I was like sitting there and I'm going, you know, I would love to have it. And we were sitting on the outside and I asked the waiter, I said, you know, can you, can you smoke? Because I wasn't sitting at that coffee shop out there. Can you smoke here? And he said, yes, exact same thing, but no tobacco. I was like, Got you, man. Pack my pipe. And, you know, back then, if you remember, you know, the coffee shops are there, almost all those coffee shops would, you would buy something and you'd say, could you roll me something? And they would try to roll you a joint with tobacco. And I'd be like, no, no, no. I'd break out my pipe. And you'd be the only person sitting there in the coffee shop with a pipe packed with nothing but hash and cut and, uh, and leaf. It was great. And they'd know you were American, too, when they saw you just smoking only cannabis, no tobacco. They're like, okay immediately and they'd be like no they're the real deal <laughs> right? yeah 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 well i mean you know now we're starting to see all over the country even in california and several other places new york you know the new new york law will allow for on-site consumption they said in new york and i you know someone made the joke um that you know what they said was that you can smoke anywhere you can smoke tobacco you can smoke cannabis absolutely said, well good luck finding a place in new york where you can smoke tobacco but but you can, you, uh, you can find in New York, you can find places where you can smoke tobacco. People walk around in the park, Central yeah, Park, right? People walk around, you know, on the streets as long as you're not walking past a school, you know, um, there really isn't a problem with that. And then, you know, there will be facilities open up or some of the, the, the you know, uh, micro uh, dispensaries will have on site consumption. It's amazing. I never thought it would happen in my lifetime, man. I'm, you probably didn't either. Um, I, you know, well, I got to tell you, way back, I, I, I've kind of always thought as we started moving forward more medicinally around the country, I, I always thought that there would be an opportunity for consumption. I didn't believe anywhere, but I thought that, you know, we will eventually hit a spot where you'll be able to consume in a restaurant or consume in a location. And I'm glad we're finally getting there. And more and more states, once New York opens, the rest of them are going to follow. Yeah, I believe you did know, man, because you were one of the first, you know, real black pioneers, especially, but people in general, especially from a celebrity standpoint, to come out, you know, and, and have that legitimacy, but then speak for it. Um, you had to believe it, you know, to really come out and, and, and do those things at that point. So that's, I believe that. Well, thank you, sir. I mean, you know, back before it was oh, you nailed it. I mean, back before it was Vogue, man. I can remember, you know, some of my early advocacy. I was kind of on my own, 
I mean, people like, you know, shun me. People were afraid to, to, to say anything out loud. But they would come up to me and whisper, man, I'm really back what you're doing with cannabis. <laughs> 2002, 2003, I'm like, dude, break out the joint and shut up. <laughs> I mean, but I mean, you know, so now I'm glad that at least a larger number of us are coming out of the shadows and literally starting to speak some truth. Let's talk a little bit about your, you created something called Loud, right? Talk a little bit about what Loud is. Man, Montel, Loud, I mean, first is really just the epitome of, of my love for cannabis, right? And, you know, me being a connoisseur and me before going to Amsterdam, looking at the High Times magazines and looking at all the amazing flowers and then looking at what I was smoking probably from Mexico, right? And being like, man, there's a big difference between what I'm looking at and, and what I'm smoking and, and kind of the quest to get there, you know, the quest to get to the, to the best genetics, the best cannabis, the best effects, and having a real curated menu that um that that's reflective of all these different terpene profiles and categories that have really driven the trends in the industry, man. So it's just it, it's a connoisseur's company for connoisseurs, and it's really bringing together these two aspects that I think cannabis helps to really epitomize is that you know the intersection of nature and you know here in portland oregon there's this beautiful nature this epic nature all around us in the pacific northwest and this urban culture um and and the city right that i think only you can find here in, in portland and a few other places in the country but that cannabis really exemplifies and that that's that's who we are right we're the the true connoisseurs cannabis culture in in portland oregon um we want to exemplify this portland this oregon this pacific northwestern cannabis culture um through the eyes of a, of a diverse company of a black owned company well you know now uh, do, are you i'm sure you've got to be like everyone we're all hoping that eventually there's some sort of federal legislation that allows for companies like yours to actually sell your products outside of your state uh but right now you're kind of faced with just being stuck with oregon and portland being your uh consumer base right it's honestly a beautiful situation for a small business owner, Montel, especially a, a, a craft, small batch cannabis grower, right? With not a lot of resources. Uh, we got to figure out how to bootstrap. We got to figure out how to operate at low cost and how to provide a value to the market that, the con that really drives the consumer, right? In this big saturated market, if you can reach that consumer and move them, then I think you got something. So it's given us the opportunity to really kind of hone our craft in this this micro market. Um, and I think it's it's putting us in a position where we're, you know, salivating for that opportunity to sell into other states to compete against the larger players um, and to really to build the brand. So, you know, there's there's some pluses and and, and some minuses, but we're focusing on the pluses as it relates to, to building our business. Well, you know, I started one of my, uh, you know, I have a line also of product that I literally started up there in the Portland area with Cura. Um, and I was in, oh man, I probably, I was in quite a large number of dispensaries. I'm right now out of the marketplace, but I'm about ready to come back in. I just signed a deal here on the East Coast where I'm going to go back and providing my CBD products across the country. And then hopefully within you know, the next month or two, I will be back in full force in the THC and broad spectrum um, uh, products uh, again through relationship in New Jersey. But I'm looking forward to getting back in the space. I mean, it's just there's nothing like it. Yeah, I mean, we've got to have the pioneers uh, like yourself in the industry, you know, helping to shape um, to shape the regulations, benefiting from the growth, making money, hiring. Um, you know, so it'll be good, to, you know, when you're back in the market and, you know, continuing to to build on your brand because, um, you know, we definitely need it. And, you know, the stuff that's happening on the East Coast and New Jersey and New York is extremely exciting. So I'm, I'm glad you're making some moves over there. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And I'm, you know, down the road. I mean, I'd love to be able to, you know, make sure we keep the door open because, you know, I'm I'm so sick and tired of the fact that this industry has become such a pitting everyone against each other where synergistically we could work together and even improve all of our games, right? I mean, yeah, it, you know, it's, it's an interesting industry, man. Um, you know, when you see it, especially coming from the ground where, you know, I've, I've come from the basements and I, you know, I know a lot of those players who have a problem with 
um, you know, bigger companies and, you know, celebrities having brands and, you know, guys who are selling this product versus that product and people who believe in this versus that. And it, it there's definitely a lot of infighting, um, you know, because everybody's looking to get their piece and no one wants to be left out. And you know, I think there's a lot of that happening to where I definitely understand it. But, you know, without a doubt, there's so many opportunities in this market. There's so much growth. It's it's mind blowing. So, I mean, I think with the the effort that's used, you know, with picking against you know other companies or other people, if you focus a little bit of that effort on exploring the, you know, the myriad opportunities in the industry, I think people would be a lot better served. And, you know, having a lot of those pioneers and a lot of those people who have been in it from the beginning serves the industry better. So um, I think we need those people. And um, and, you know, we definitely need need all people uh, because that's what cannabis is about. I've often said, like, if you look at all the products out there other than essential products, right, like, you know, toilet paper and, you know, toothpaste, right, that everyone has to use. If you look at non-essential products that are out there, cannabis is one of the ones I think that has the broadest, you know, demographic of users, right? Every you get, we, and you just use the term non-essential, but in several states during COVID, we found out how essential cannabis was. One of the only, you know, I think uh, recession-proof industries in this country in the last year and a half, because you've seen that cannabis sales have gone up all over the country. Anywhere there's cannabis sales, cannabis sales have, have risen. And it's because, you know, I think people are starting to finally get a grip and understanding that, you know, A, alcohol isn't the only game in town and B, alcohol can be as detrimental and deleterious to your health as it can be. And several people after being sequestered away and, and hunkered down, you know, after about a month and a half, they got tired of waking up the next morning with that nasty hangover from killing a bottle of, you know, whatever brown liquor was that they had. And so now, they started to realize, hey, you know, I don't feel that bad having experienced the night with something that not only made me feel good, but was good for me. So now, you know, there's the sales are up. And now it's time, I think, again, for this industry to not waste time, but to try to come together to push forward and to push those that we voted for who claim that they were going to back us get them off their butt and make them stand up to the plate and go before Congress and Senate and pass some laws. Yeah. 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 You're exactly right, man. I mean, I think that, um, I think that, you know, we're, we're going to miss a boat. We're going to miss a massive opportunity if we don't kind of get focused and, and make sure that a lot of the laws and the things that, you know, we believe should happen. You look at the opinion polls and all those things, right. Um, that, that the country believes, should happen um you know if we don't make sure that it happens if we don't create a better industry and not just another industry um i think we're all going to look back at it you know 10 20 years from now and say damn we, we missed that opportunity we won't say we blew it if we yeah. don't step up i know you you're absolutely right because you nailed it man we, you know the cannabis industry is like the wright brothers pushing that wooden plane down a hill right now we haven't even gotten beyond pushing that wooden plane down a hill Yep. It's time to now start thinking about jet engines and being on the forefront and start thinking about the jet engine before it's even made. And that's what cannabis right now is open. You know, I'm, I'm looking at some opportunities internationally right now, some opportunities in South America, some opportunities in South Africa. I'm looking at opportunities that are available in, you know, um, you don't have to go into these opportunities saying, well, it's me, 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 me. No, man, I want to be a part of a bigger puzzle you know that little square in the corner of the right hand side of that puzzle well if that's not there the puzzle's not finished yeah i don't mind being that little square i don't care if there's another 100 pieces up there or that that board i just want to be that little square and if that little square contributes to the whole and makes that beautiful picture come on man why not right yeah yeah no i agree 100 percent. i think you're you're right. You got to find that. And, and it's unfortunate in the industry that you got a lot of people and a lot of players who are kind of the people who are in those pictures and in those circles who don't really know what they're doing, who don't have the best intention. Um, and what I've seen a lot of people who are looking for, um, you know, it's 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 intoxicating a little bit that, you know, people are interested. People care. People want to you know, write an article about you. People want to talk about it. You know, your friends are, you know, think you're cool because you're in the industry. So 
a lot of times people get a little more so focused on that limelight if you if it even is one in, in this industry and not focused on doing the work on adding the value to the market on all these different things that they I start dreaming about. about they start dreaming about ego before they start you know getting the 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 hardcore fact done i mean you know too many people are too too quick to try to you know promote their ego rather than promote what it is that they're doing and and you know, we, I, I feel like, you know, one of the biggest problems with this industry to date has been the fact that we, you know, got so busy trying to push B to B, business to business, business to business, that we forgot and left the consumer on the sideline. And we remember now that the, most of the consumers have come to the table with cannabis because they have some sort of underlying health issue that they're trying to address. And so many of us have gotten so busy trying to think, oh, I can get in the wreck. I'm going to get in the wreck. Stop wreck. Wreck is just a term that's used to say it's non-medical, but or it's saying adult use. But I'm going to go and say that all of those who are majority of those who are adult users don't even know that they are deep down inside medical users to begin with, because they gravitated towards cannabis for an underlying reason that was more medically based. You, I mean, hey, that we could probably have a whole podcast on that statement that you just made that I think a lot of people don't understand or still just rec versus medical. And it's it's just that cannabis is an herb that, that gravitates your your endocannabinoid system. When Correct. you experience cannabis is saying, oh, there's something there that I need. It's helping me to get to its homeostasis, right? This state of homeostasis. And I, I need that. That's why you like it. That's why you enjoy it. Um, and it's helping your body in some way. And what I didn't know Whenever I was fighting my parents, you know, to keep me away from cannabis and getting drug tested and getting in trouble and getting grounded was that, you know, and, and it was crazy because I was getting in trouble. Um, I was using cannabis when I first experienced cannabis and I had D's in math, right? D's and C's. And throughout that period of me consuming cannabis, still getting in trouble, my grades in math started to improve to where I became an A student in math. And then my parents wanted to still be mad at me. But they couldn't be mad at me because I was bringing home straight A's now. Um, and I think with me, what it helped is that, you know, I, I had some level of ADHD, maybe. I don't know. But it was something where I could not sit down and focus for long enough. I'm thinking about this, want to do that. And cannabis helped me to really sit down and comprehend some of those complex things. People don't understand the fact that rather than cannabis being something that works deleteriously against your brain, making you not focus cannabis is probably have you ever been behind a person driving a car who's high <laughs> exactly <laughs> heavily focused they're so focused it's it's crazy you know and i'm not not suggesting that you go get high before you drive but you know the truth of the matter is i I'm, i i understand you and hear you and hear you clearly i mean i am way more focused on solving a problem if i am have utilized some cannabis in before I try to solve that problem. If I don't, I might not even mess with it. I might stay away from it because I'm afraid of it. But and when we look back in time, some of our greatest minds on this planet, remember somebody that we consider one of the greatest minds ever to live, Albert Einstein smoked a little cannabis. So stop with this stupidity. I mean, I, I just, it just drives me nuts when people think that this is something that, you know, uh, will stop you from concentrating. It's quite the opposite. Hopefully people are getting over that by now where it's like cannabis is linked with stupidity. I mean, that that definitely was the, um, you know, the thing, lazy stoner or stupid stoner. Or your mind isn't working. My mom used to say, you look zonked out right? as, as if I don't know what I'm doing. But, um, you know, I think you know, there's so many successful people and there's so many stories to the contrary that hopefully anybody who cares to actually learn has gotten over that a long time ago and certain people are, are don't care to learn so they'll never get over that well that's why we have to make sure we put the pressure on those in positions to do things like this president our president right now who you know still thinks that cannabis is some sort of a gateway drug stop the stupid you know we got a vice president who claimed during uh while they were running for office that they were going to be very supportive of cannabis you know uh, legislation Psh. As soon as they got elected, turn their back. And it's going to be one of these things. And we noticed that who pushed the hemp bill through? Republicans. 
not Democrats, Republicans push the hemp bill through. And we're probably going to see coming up on this next election, you're going to see more noise out of Republican candidates for some sort of candidates for some sort of legislative reform when it comes to cannabis, because they recognize that this is a voting force right now. This is a, a voting group that's waiting and waiting with bated breath for them to do something to tell me it's OK. And when you look back in time, I mean, you know, it's very I've, I've been talking about this quite a bit, but, you know, they oh, about three or four years ago, they ran a test on the pipes that they were had sitting on the desk that they took from Benjamin Franklin's home and had in the Smithsonian Institute. And somebody decided, hmm, let me scrape that pipe out and see what he was smoking. Homeboy was hitting himself some hemp. There ain't no question. Really? All of our forefathers were growers of. All of them grew it. All of them sold it. Right. Why? Because we made all of our sheets, all of our sails, all of our clothes. The entire revolutionary army was clothed in hemp. I mean, damn it, that's how we declared victory against the Brits, wearing hemp uniforms. Come on. They weren't just wearing it. They were smoking it. How do you think people got, you know, I mean, I, I like to ask people, you know, just think about this, man. Go back to 1695. Go back to 1735. It was cold, wet, damp, humid, hot. It were bugs. You were sleeping on the ground. You know what I mean? You used leaves to wipe your butt. Excuse me. You ain't going to tell me that they didn't walk over to that plant and take a little bit of that plant? Of course they did. And of course, we have for thousands of years. So, you know, we're finally hitting a spot where I think, you know, you, you nailed it. When you look at some of the current polls, you look at some of the, the you know, what people have stated, you know, the majority of people in this country support over 80 percent support medical cannabis and well over 60 percent support adult use cannabis. So it's time for us to get some of these draconian laws thrown out the books. But the only problem is, is that that precludes people from arresting young black men like you or me or young Hispanic people of color. You know, you, you, you're starting to, to impact the, the train and the flow of people into these for-profit prisons. So we got to recognize why cannabis laws are still in place. Why do they use cannabis you know, and and knock on the door of a kid in, in downtown Chicago, Detroit, but they leave the kid in Wall Street alone. Excuse me, we know why. So let's get race out of the equation, right? Yeah, man, doesn't that just show you the power of propaganda? How, um, you know, that level of propaganda, you know, pushed by the government and, you know, by, by a lot of law enforcement has, you know, just completely turn the view of cannabis, something that really honestly was obviously put here to help humanity in so many, many, many different ways as turning into something illegal. And at the same time, the only alternative or the only way that people can kind of legally kind of um, escape in a little way, right? Even though cannabis helps with many other things other than just euphoria, right? Um, but the only way that people can escape is alcohol that has killed so many people, drunk driving, violence, right? That is their only means. What if there was this, you know, this legal, you know, healthy means to do those things and also help your body over all those many, many decades? It's just, it's mind blowing um, kind of, you know, what has happened and, and hopefully we can fix things as we move forward, but it, it's disappointing to see the current administration. Um, but, you know, fortunately, I think it's something that they, that, you know, it's such a strong, such a fast moving train that they're going to have to get in line eventually um, or otherwise they're going to get ran over. I agree with you. And, 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 you know, the fact that none of them even acknowledge the fact that our own government, through its own research dollars and funded research that we've done for the last 50 years, gave ourselves a patent. Folks, if you're watching, you're tuning in, it's patent number 6630507. That patent has been in existence since the year 2002. And that is a patent where the U.S. government owns cannabinoids. They own CBD. So they, they own the patent on CBD and have extended that patent multiple times. So it's not like this is something we're asking for that isn't legitimate. You know, when you had Jeff Sessions stand, we can't find any medicinal purpose behind cannabis. That's an ignorant person right there, right from the beginning with. If you don't even read the laws that are on the books, 
and don't even read the information that's on the books before you step up and make a statement like that, how the hell can you make a statement like that? Like we said, there's one of those, you know, that's one of the people who don't. Unfortunately, I'm learning that as I get older and older, right? Is there some people who are set in their ways and they don't want to, they don't even want to hear when you tell them something. It's like, it's, it's unfortunate and it hurts you a little bit where it's like, listen, just listen, just look. Um, some people do not even want, they, they don't want to hear it. They're not open to it and they don't want to listen. And, you know, I, I think there's more of those people who are at least are open a little bit to facts and knowledge. And that's why we're seeing those opinion polls, you know, grow drastically in favor of legalization. But there's still some people like the Jeff Sessions and other people out there. Um, and it's so surprising to see. I was there was an attorney general. I was at some meeting um, of attorney generals. I was lucky to be invited just to hear how they're talking about cannabis. And I believe it was the attorney general in Colorado at the time, Montel, who was talking to all the other attorney generals across the country. And of course, they're looking at him like, you know, he's from Colorado, right? As we know, they, they have to know cannabis. Everyone there knows cannabis. And he's talking about um, how he's, he's making the comparison between cannabis extracts or concentrates, right, which is essentially just the cannabinoids in these trichomes brought together, the, the, the purest essence, in a sense, of the plant without the other plant matter, one of the most healthiest things to consume, in my opinion. He's talking about that, and he's making the comparison to, I think, meth. Um, and he's saying, yeah, they, you know, it's just like how they, you know, they, they cook it, and, you know, it's on a sheet, and they break it up. So he's been watching Breaking Bad, right? And he's making these connections to how you make cannabis extract and methamphetamines that are destroying so many cities in our nation. And it's seen as just this automatic connection because he's making this connection to how they're making it. And with all these other attorney, gener attorney generals across the nation are listening to this guy. And that was like maybe two years ago, Montel. I know, man. It's, it, it is absolutely sick. I mean, I was going to ask you, what do you think some of the biggest problems are right now when it comes to our industry? What do you think some of the biggest problems are? You know, I think you you mentioned uh, one of the most important ones, right, is the, the focus on B2B and, and making money and how do you, you know, extend this contract or, you know, get this fundraising and financing um, and not enough thought on the B2C, right? And how do you make sure that you're helping Right. Not just the consumers, but the caregivers. Right. And the customers. How are you helping them to navigate this new world of cannabis? How are you helping them to find what they need and what's going to be more effective and helping them to do it at a cost effective manner? Right. That's not going to break their bank. Um, I think there's not enough focus on that, unfortunately. And that's kind of what's driving us more towards another industry versus a better industry, because people don't understand this sort of a short sighted way of thinking. And if I can get this contract, then I can make this money versus saying, hey, if I can navigate these consumers and develop a product that adds value and helps them to get, then maybe I don't make that same amount of money in this first year. But in the next 10 years, I've really developed something that adds value to people's lives and I've created something different. Right. I mean, it's, it's hard. And I understand because there's so many dollars being made. But that, I think, is the biggest problem. I think also. Um, the, the effect on the environment, right? And that's why I'm working with the Resource Innovation Institute and helping to come up with, you know, um, ways of cultivating that, you know, aren't so harmful, right? That are effective, ways that are regenerative uh, to our environment that really helped us produce quality cannabis um, in a responsible way. It, it's crazy that we would destroy or hurt the environment by growing a plant. You know what I mean? Especially like, a plant that can actually leach heavy metals and, and deleterious stuff out of the soil and make for a better planet. We're using it and growing it in a way that's really bad for the environment. Let's talk a little bit more about that because, you know, I understand that, you know, a lot of, you know, the indoor grows it waste a lot of water. There's so much wasted water. And there's so much tainted soil that's not reused or regenerated. Once you do one crop, then you throw it out and get another crop, you know. So, I mean, what are some of the bad impacts of this, of, of our industry on the environment? Yeah, man. So I think there's a few things. So, you know, and getting down to it, of course, energy, right? The energy waste and 
a lot of lights and using energy efficient, inefficient equipment, um, most of the time in indoor grows, but also um, drying in green from greenhouses or utilizing um, dehumidification or even cooling in greenhouses. So there's a lot of different areas where energy is, is really um, hurting our industry and utilizing more en energy than we need to create this plant. Um, I think the, the other place is waste, right? You mentioned that in the soil, but also we're required to tag each and every plant, thousands of plants that go through our facility every day with, I wish I had one in here, a, a plastic tag that essentially is over regulation, right? Of this way of this, this fear-based regulation on this plant that has us over-regulating in a way that creates so much waste that it's hard to get over, right? So child-proof packaging is crazy too, right? The third one, right? The child-proof packaging. Um, and then the third one, water, right? I mean, you said it, right? You you using too much water um, and not, you know, being um, being efficient and conserving water wherever possible. And some people, some things that people don't know is that cannabis is one of the least thirsty plants of most of the produce that we use. Um, when I was on that environmental task force uh, that the government appointed, there was a, a gentleman there that grew all these different organic vegetables in addition to cannabis. And he said cannabis uh, is actually the least water, uh, the, the lowest water user. The most, the biggest water user was lettuce. He's like, lettuce uses about 20 times more water than cannabis, right? But you don't hear anybody saying let's not have any lettuce because it uses too much water. So I think it's really about, you know, what I did back in engineering, I did a lot of this stuff, I won't go into it, but there's low hanging fruit all around this industry of little small things that we can do, technology that we can apply, um, different ways of thinking and how we cultivate this plant, whether indoor, greenhouse or purely outdoor, that can drastically help and switch things around that I think people are not aware of yet. People are just implementing, but also that we cannot finance, right? We cannot, we don't have the money to say, hey, I want to go to this bank and invest in this piece of equipment where I can see this return on investment within a year. Um, and it can help me to reduce my carbon footprint. Um, but I can't invest in it because I don't have necessarily the funds to invest in things that don't have a payback of two months. So there's a lot of things that have to happen that are happening, but that need to happen a lot faster in the industry to push us in that direction that we need to go. And the one other thing, Montel, that I want to say, you said the other problem where the problems with the industry is that there's not enough people who are really representative of the real consumers out there. And I mean, diverse demographics, including black people, but including other people out there that are not benefiting from this industry, um, especially black people who have been arrested at disproportionate rates drastically across the nation that are not benefiting, whether that's business ownership, whether that is um, living wage employment, career employment, or whether that is community benefits, right? Um, that just giving this tax money, figuring out ways to boost or bolster the community through some of this tax appropriation that can be done that is not just about doing the right thing, but is about doing things that will grow our industry and grow our communities and grow our economy by the legalization of cannabis. So I think that's the other thing and big thing that I'm working on um, that that is that is drastically or it's very, very much needed in this industry for us to again become a better industry, not just another industry. Absolutely. I mean, the challenge is, I think, you know, a lot of these states have written these equity the equity programs in, but literally some of that equity program programming is nothing more than just a uh, facelift, not even a facelift. They just are, throw it out there to see if they can, you know, slap one or two minorities on your board list and say, I'm covered, rather than actually be inclusive. You're exactly right. I mean, it's more it's lip service. And to be honest, Montel, what I what I've seen is that, you know, it's it's it was used in a similar way in cannabis legalization. What I remember in sitting in those legislative halls and it was a little later in legalization, 2011, 2012. But the same arguments were being used. We need to legalize all the way because we're arresting too many black and brown people. It's a you know criminal justice issue. That's why we need to legalize. So now that it's legalized, right, you still see people being arrested 
and you don't see people benefiting. So it's 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 lip well, service to this equity I, thing in a lot of ways. You're nailing it. I mean, you look at the state of California, there were more people arrested in 17, 2017, 2018 after you had, you know, adult use in the state than before. And they were majority, 80 percent of them were brown and black people. So there was no no kind of a, a recess on, you know, going out and throwing anybody dark skin in jail. That's what we were doing. That's right. That's right. So, I mean, now that because that's what happened. They used it to get legalization and they being many advocates used that argument, right? Whatever argument you can get to get legalization passed. But now that it's passed, they don't care really quite as much about those things. And I think that's a lot of what's happening with this social equity stuff and that, you know, the, they, they've now started using that to get legislation passed. Um, and, you know, now that we had it, hey, it's written, look, it didn't do very well. That's because right. it wasn't really done in a genuine way in the first place. And that hurts the cause in a lot of ways. Right. So I, it, it's definitely something that is a trend of, again, using, um, you know, these causes to to usher in legalization or usher in a new industry, but not doing it in a way that is is really genuine. Well, tell me a little bit about the Minority Cannabis Business Association that you co-founded. So when I got in Montel, um, you know, there in, in the industry, when I moved from Germany back to Portland, there when you look up black people in cannabis, and one of the ways that I was able to to rise so fast in the engineering world is because I had mentors. And it wasn't just black mentors, um, it was other mentors, right? I, one of my first bosses is a white guy that helped me so much um throughout that engineering world to understand that and to figure out ways to navigate. And when I got into cannabis, I realized that that wasn't there, right? And naturally, it was a new industry, um, but especially it wasn't there for Black people. And I know that the main reason that I was successful in engineering and in corporate is because I saw my dad, who rose up from being a janitor to being a vice president with the company, right? Just by him navigating and doing these moves and making connections. And I constantly watched him. And the only reason I thought I could be successful in corporate was because I saw him do it. And I think that's when, when I got into cannabis, I saw that was missing is I wasn't sure if I can do it. I decided to jump in because I had all these things pushing me into the industry, but I wasn't sure. And I knew that there were a lot of other people out there like that who I couldn't connect to you, right? You had so many other things happening. And I Googled you and I saw you, um, but I knew that there wasn't a group of people. There wasn't a mentor. So I decided to start MCBA with a few other people um, you know, some of the most notable people that were on the board at the time were the Wanda James, uh, Charlo Green, um, you mm -hmm. know, uh, a lot of amazing people uh, helped me to, to really build that organization. But it was mainly for that purpose so that we had a group of people that other people could see that said, hey, they can do it. Hey, they're successful. Hey, I can reach out to those people. Hey, they're helping to be at the table to help to open up opportunities for me. So that's what I did with MCBA. And since I stepped down from that organization, it's continued to thrive. Some of the most notable people in the industry have continued to push it forward. But I'm now focused on more of a local effort that now the New Leaf Project is going to cross over. Uh, the other nonprofit that I started along with my wife will cross over the million dollar mark this year in grants and loans. That we Let's talk about talk about that. Your wife's name is Jeanette. Jeanette was on one of our first guests on Let's Be Blown Motel. And the the new not the nonprofit that you have is called New Leaf Project. Tell us about what that does. Yeah, so New Leaf Project is kind of a a, a focus from MCBA. MCBA we focus a lot on policy and and reform efforts as well as business. But New Leaf is focused on you know what's the best way to create intergenerational wealth within our communities is business ownership. Period. Point blank. I'm experiencing now. I went from one guy in the grow room. Now we have a staff of 15 people. I've hired a lot of my friends, right? So I'm people from my community. So we say, you know, that's the best way to focus. So we join with the city of Portland. Um, they're giving us some of their tax money from the cannabis taxes. Uh, we've joined with other organizations across the nation uh, where companies have given us money to then utilize that to give grants and low interest and 0% interest loans to black and brown businesses in the cannabis industry to do just that, help them to invest and these small business opportunities, these are return on investment projects 
that will help them to build their company so that they can then go and create wealth and help their community. So that's what New Leaf Project is focused on uh, primarily, and we're doing some great work. That's unbelievable. And then where where do you want to see the the industry go, say, in the next year? What would you like to see happen in the next year? That's a good question. Usually people say five years, but you're a smart dude. You know the cannabis industry. You can't you can't say that really, right? The next year, where do we want mm. to see it happen? I think that's a very smart way to approach it. I want to see um, federal legalization open up, Montel. I want to see us start to open up these opportunities for uh, interstate commerce so that we can really grow some of these small businesses um, so that we can open up opportunities for more people more uh, in more states and more cities. Um, that's that's all I want, man. I mean, there's I, I probably got a laundry list of things that I want for the industry. Oregon equity is something that has never happened. I never got an equity opportunity. I'm just there. There's no equity plan in Oregon. So I would love for that to happen. Um, that's something that we're working on. But, you know, really, I want federal legalization to happen so that we can really grow these businesses in a way that is truly scalable and we can go after some of these protected companies um, that, you know, are in states where they only have four cultivation licenses and they're just, you know, sitting back, raking their money. I want to compete with those guys and go after them. So, you know, federal Absolutely. legalization has to happen. Absolutely. And now you're also sitting on the board for Ben and Jerry, who are Ben, um, uh, uh, who Ben's best, uh, Ben and Jerry's. Are we going to see a, a, an ice cream, cannabis ice cream come out soon? You know what? I've, I've mentioned that to Ben before. I don't know if Ben has some uh, non-compete clauses with Ben and Jerry's now or, or not, but uh, he he's decided not to move in the in the ice cream realm quite yet. They're doing a really dope low THC pre-roll line that I think is going to really like hit the industry by storm. Some really new, exciting things. Um, and I'm just lucky enough, really, not really be focused on the business aspect of that um, organization, but to be focused on the give back aspect um, and that he's giving away 100 percent of the profits um, to uh, to nonprofit organizations. Uh, the New Leaf Project being one of them. Uh, also, Last Prisoner Project. Um, and other organizations, right, that are going to benefit from the profits of the cannabis industry, which I think is what it's all about. So I'm, I'm happy to be on that board and help to direct some of those uh, more uh, more um, interesting, right, sometimes more than just cannabis business. It's more interesting to see how we can really do good and utilize this industry to, uh, to, to grow um, small businesses and, and grow communities in a, in a really strong, positive way. Well, Jesse, I can't thank you enough for being a part of Let's Be Blunt with Montella Day, man. I tell you, it's been really a pleasure just chatting with you and talking to you. Anything else you want to add? Man, it's a dream come true uh, for me to be uh, talking to you, Montel, Montel Show. And uh, man, somehow you still look the same from whenever I was, uh, what, that'd be 25 years ago when I was watching you on TV, bro. You still look the same. So oh, man, that's, thank uh, you. that's a, um, a, a good positive positive uh, mark for cannabis, y'all. Take a look at him. Absolutely, my friend. Well, look, if people wanted to get a hold of you and get some more information, where do they go? Please hit me up. Um, Instagram is, is my most active thing, at Jesse Horton, uh, J-E-S-C-E Horton. Um, the company at The Loud, at T-H-E-L-O-W-D, Loud, L-O-W-D. And also, um, you know, just hit us up on the website, www.loud.com, L-O-W-D.com. Um, and, and, I'm, and I'm sure all of your product is available in dispensaries all over Portland. That's right. 40 dispensaries across the state um, and, and dispensary list is growing. we got a large waiting list that we're trying to add. Um, but then also anybody who's interested um, in some of the nonprofit work, uh, hit us up at newleafproject.org. N-U-L-E-A-F project.org. Thanks so much, sir. Well, you know you always have a home here, my friend. If you ever want to come back and just kick it and chop it up on some of the other things that we can be talking about, because there's a lot to talk about in this space. You know that. Bro, there's a lot to talk about, and it seems like we have a lot in common. We need to go ahead, go to Amsterdam, man, and sit down in uh, Barney's or, or Greenhouse or something like Greenhouse. that. Greenhouse. Come on, Grasshopper, Greenhouse. Remember those two? Yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. for sure. Absolutely. I'd love to, my friend. Let's do it. Um, yeah, but let's just figure out a time over the next year, especially as things start to open up. Maybe we'll get a chance to do that. Maybe we might even be able to do it in New York City. Aha.
Hey, that would be even better, honestly, right now in our U.S. In New, New York or in New Jersey. I'll keep you posted on what's going on with me. And then, you know, uh, maybe you can come on into New Jersey and we'll go to one of the dispensaries there. Yeah, please let me know, Monte. I look forward to seeing your growth, continued growth and leadership. I mean, I really mean it. Um, you know, I don't give it up to a lot of people in the industry. We're kind of, I'm, I'm still, I'm a little bit industry protective as well. Um, but I mean, you're one of the pioneers, bro. You're one of the people that first started saying, hey, there's people out there who are legitimate that are speaking up for cannabis, um, you know, cannabis legalization. And and um, thank you uh, for that. Continue to uh, continue to lead and let me know if you ever need anything. Thanks, sir. And when you're out there doing the lobbying that you're doing with all the things you're working on, you can call on me anytime you need. OK, thank you, bro. I appreciate it. I'm a friend. You be well. Thanks for joining me on Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Please make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell to be notified when new episodes post each week. We'd love to hear your feedback also, so please send us your comments. Uh, 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 uh.